You know, for, for this, for me, this is an extraordinary occasion. And I just wanted to congratulate David and Nita on the fantastic job they've done in raising the profile of the engagement cause. Because unlike glancing around practically everybody else in this room, I started my career at least 30 years ago when business in the UK was just so different. All my early years were struggling against the culture of business at that time. The insularity, the Britishness, the hierarchy, the ageism, not to mention sexism, the stuffy attitudes, the love of titles, the privileges, the cars and the perks and the benefits, the offices. You could tell exactly who somebody was by the size of their office or the size of their desk. Um, and more than that, in those days, our attitude to work, and I was the youngest partner in McKinsey at the time, and we were not different, was that it was about productivity. And work, people in the workplace were essentially commodities. So we sliced and diced the workforce. We went in for something called de-skilling to reduce all the discretionary effort or the joy out of what people did in the workplace. We want to be able to measure it like we measured any other input. This was the era of the production line. And our attitude was that work and workplace pe people were available. You want to hire people, you paid them, and they came. Now, that's all over. You know, this isn't just about a nice thing to do. It's about the fact that the world has changed. And actually, I think most British business have businesses have changed to a degree. Engagement, to me, is not a fashion. It's a change in business, and it's a change in the people and their attitudes to work. You see, I think the days when people came to work just to earn a daily crust have gone. Thank God they've gone. Of course, there are parts of the country here where people can't find work, and it's very hard for them. And of course, the people who are, doing, who are working hard in work, in jobs they don't enjoy just to pay for the family. But the vast majority of people, and the vast majority of people you employ, especially in the southeast of England, actually decide whether they want to work. So if you talk to young people, they're so self-confident, they decide whether they want to work. And then they decide where they want to work. I think our attitude now should be that all work is voluntary. The where you work is voluntary, and the pace of work is voluntary. Peace work is a thing of the past. You don't pay people for what they do. You give them a fair wage and involve them in the organization, and then elicit their effort and their knowledge and their talents. I think, too, that we've just come through an era which we'll look back on as bizarre. It was the era of the financial services system, where bonuses created a transactional mentality to employment. Now, in the city, essentially, the, the, the attitude arose that unless you give people a substantial bonus, they won't work hard for you. And as a result, because we treat people, treated people, executives, as transactions, they end up treating the system as a transaction, and they treat their employee, employer as a transaction. So the attitude is whether they stay or go, whether they work hard or not work hard, is all part of the deal for that year. I think we'll look back on that as the most peculiar era and something that actually isn't very relevant for most businesses, certainly isn't relevant for most ordinary working people. One of the things I come on to this later is if you talk to ordinary working people, people work in shops or work in factories or in call centers, most of them tell you that the bonus is far from the most important thing at work. What matters to them most is the workplace community and whether they're treated with respect and whether they're involved in the business. And bonuses typically create a sense of resentment and unfairness. It's not they have no part to play, but they can reinforce a culture, they don't create a culture. You see, I think too, People's attitudes to work has changed so much. No, hierarchy is dead. Young people don't come out of school thinking one person is naturally more important than another. So when they come to work, 
They don't assume that a job title makes somebody some, some way superior. In fact, they don't assume that a position in the organization chart confers on somebody the right to command. All management has to be earned. The ability to command or to decide is something that has to be legitimized by workplace, by engaging people and bringing them along with you. You know, we're, we're all familiar with the idea that you, you produce some great new corporate initiative. And in today's workplace, typically in good companies, you'll get a round of applause. What it means is people say, are saying yes, but they mean no. In other words, it's easy to get the idea of consent. It's very hard to get people's hearts and minds that extra piece of discretionary effort that makes all the difference between success and failure. Work is a big part of people's lives. You know, in the old days, work didn't really matter to them in the sense that it was how they earned the money to pay for the things that did really matter for them. Now, I think you talk to young people, it does matter. When they go home, it helps to find their identity. You know, I work for Apple, I work for IBM. This is who I am. They want to believe in it. They want to go to the pub and the neighbours and so on and say, I'm doing something worthwhile. And with what is most of, my wake, most of my waking life, I'm doing something I think actually is quite good for society and for my country and for the world. And most of us here work for companies that are seeking to do something worthwhile. We're not working just for, to grow the earnings per share. I mean, that's good, that's cool. But it's not just what we're doing. We're, we're being able to do that because we're delivering something for people. In Asda's case, making people who live on a budget, making their lives more affordable. In ITV's case, we're seeking to entertain, to engage, to lighten up people's lives. Most of you work for businesses, organizations that do something similar. I mean, there may be somebody here who works for Imperial Tobacco. I think that's more of a challenge, but, you know... <laughs> So if we're trying to do something good and worthwhile, then we need to invite our people to be part of that. Young people come to work in search of values. There may be some that don't, but the majority are looking for fulfillment. And they want to know that we value them and they're invited to be part of the good things that we're seeking to do. They want to be part of the change. The days when people want to be they wanted stability. They just wanted the same this year, next year, the year after. I don't think that's the way people think now. I think we're an exciting world. They can see it changing. They want to know, how are we changing? Can I be part of that journey too? I always say, you know, most of my fate in life, I somehow, I've always worked for companies that in some ways have a struggle, that are challenged. I never seem to have got the jobs that everybody else wanted. So, you know, whether it's Woolworth Holdings or Asda or Energis or ITV at the time or even the Conservative Party in 1997, you know, I always seemed to turn up when everybody else had left. <laughs> I always find that, you know, I just think people will follow you anywhere. They'll follow you anywhere as long as you invite them on the journey and they'll go through any hardship as long as they can see at the end it's for something worthwhile and eventually we'll reach the sunny uplands. And it's not just people that have changed. You see, business has changed. You look at how, what we all do, what defines the best company, organization, your sector, and the worst. It's rarely now the factor costs. It's not really the productivity. It's the knowledge and the skills of the people. It's the extra discretionary effort. It's the service they deliver. You think of, we took a poll here, of businesses we really admire in the world. I bet you they'd all be businesses where we'd say the difference is they've got an amazing culture and amazing people. Think of the airlines. No, I don't know whether there's anybody here who works for airlines. Probably is. But essentially, it seems to me, airlines, they fly the same planes. They buy them all from Airbus or Boeing. They are the same plane. They fly to the same airports. The airport is not even run by them. So why do we choose one airline over another, apart from price? But we know they are very different. We know that Singapore Airlines has something else. And it's the same in supermarkets. I can go into the front of a supermarket. I spend 10 minutes just listening, listening to the crackle. I can tell you what it's like to work there. 
Because we're human beings. At the end of the world, we are purchasers. As consumers, we're human beings. And we go to the places where, which talk humanity, that have got that personality. We pick it up intuitively. It's 21 years ago today that I went to Asda, as David mentioned. It was December the... It was actually December the 10th, 1991. And... Uh, as I explained earlier, I was thrilled to bits to be getting this job. I was the youngest chief executive in the FTSE 100. It's a big company. Then about to fall out of the FTSE 100, but that's another story. And it wasn't until I got up to Leeds, I'd never been to Leeds before, that I realized I'd been standing in a queue of one. And I remember at the end of the first week ringing my wife, who stayed in London very sensibly, and saying, darling, I think you better stay down there because I'll be back soon. Because it was pretty, it really was a, a pretty depressing place. It was a broken business. It had underperformed the industry the last five years. We were sunk in debt. We couldn't afford to pay the interest on our bonds. We had terrible stores facing backwards. You arrived and the dustbins and mops were first in flow. Our people were paid less than the competition. We couldn't afford to upgrade our business. But worse than that, it was hierarchical. You know, the middle, I would say the middle management never tells the truth. There was a sort of developed version of the truth which explained why they hadn't failed really. And our competitors were world class. Sainsbury's was number, then number one and Tesco was number two. And British supermarkets were pioneering. All chilled revolution, etc., in 1994-5, Tesco announced its big program on customer service. Every little helps. One plus one on queues. They hired the consultants that presumably worked for British Airways or somebody who produced wonderful videos which were sent out to everybody in the company explaining that when you saw a customer, you had to smile. As if a video would make you smile, but... We couldn't afford any of that. We knew we couldn't. We knew we didn't have the systems, and we knew we couldn't pay people what was required. Worse than that, we had 45% labor turnover. In fact, the industry average was about 45%. We weren't worse. And even today, it's over 40%. We had 4.5% absenteeism. And just incidentally, I reckon on, on our sort of workforce... The real absenteeism, the health-driven absenteeism, should be around about 2.1%, 2.3%. Everything else over and above that is stating somebody about something about people's attitude to coming to work. We had 81% union membership. And it's nothing against unions. In my job view, the union were doing a good job for people because we weren't. But it does mean that ordinary working people, part-time working women were paying somebody to protect themselves against the employee, against me. So, kind of, it was sending a message. I remember, as an enthusiastic young chief executive, I used to go around the stores and uh, go in my own and just talk to people and listen to what they had to say. And I went bouncing. I went to a store called Rawton Stall in Lancashire. I don't know if any of you know it. It's, it's a pretty tough part of Lancashire and heavily, heavily unionised. And I went in there and I went bouncing up to a checkout operator... I think she was called Jill, and, and I said, she had her name badge, and I said, hi, uh, I'm Archie, I'm the new chief executive. And she said, hi. So I said, um, how, well, how do you find it working here? As one does. And she said, well, not very good. So, oh, <laughs> not quite what I planned on. Um, I said, well, why is that then? And she said, well, she said, you have to understand that when I was at school, and I didn't do my homework. My head teacher said to me, if you don't buck up and do your homework, you'll end up as a checkout operator at Asda. And here I am. <laughs> the point is, you're starting with people who come into work very often with low self-esteem. Now, if you employ, as Asda does today, some 130,000, 140,000 people, or we do in Australia... A very high proportion of those people don't think that by getting a job at Coles or at Asda, they've made it in life. It's our job to give them that.
that pride in a job that socially otherwise might not be respected. And the same, be you think people work in call centres or air stewardesses or in any sort of retail company, customer-facing business, their self-esteem is going to define their service and the personality they radiate to customers. You know, after that, we had a bad moment. This incidentally, none of this you'll read in the history books. No, it was all went really smoothly. But in 1993, we had a strike call. The union wanted to call a strike, unheard of in retailing. This was after two years of a pay freeze. On average, we were paying about 10% less than the competition. That was a wake-up call. We knew this could not continue. We were in a vicious circle of decline, and it had to be arrested. And we absolutely over-communicated to our people. We brought them on board. The strike call was defeated by 80 to 90% to 10 to 15. And thereafter, we never negotiated with the union on pay again. It wasn't a matter of them. It was a matter of us. And we, that's where we created, said, we have to create something special because we don't have better technology or systems. We don't have better stores. All we've got is our people. We've got our people and our values. And if we make them part of our values, we can create something special. So we set out then to create values, to, what we call values to die for. No real beliefs, a core belief in what the business did and to express those values in everything we did. So meeting the weekly shop needs of ordinary working people on a budget who demand value, making life more affordable for ordinary working people in this country and their families. And we set out to crusade the values. So we'd find things we thought were overpriced or was a big margin and crash the margin. We might not make any money, but as a way of saying this is overpriced, we broke there was something called the net book agreement. We broke the net book agreement. We broke it by selling books at a discount and invite people to challenges. Because why in this country should be people pay more, more for books that restricts reading for ordinary working people? We cut the price of over-the-counter medicines. And the manufacturers withdrew supply. But we knew they were making 60-70% margin on those medicines. And it was a way of saying, this isn't a fair price. Why should we restrict access to health care? because manufacturers are making excessive margins. So we set out to crusade the values. We set out the journey. We invited people to part for recovery. We didn't pull any punches. You know, one of the things you find in struggling businesses is people on the front line know they're struggling. The only people who don't are the generals back in staff headquarters. When I first went to ITV, one of the things that our people wanted to say to the marketplace is that although advertising had fallen and the, mar- the business company had had a very bad year, we were in a growing market. I had a look at the advertising spend on television, and I can tell you the last year is about the same as 1999. My book, that's not a growing market. So I said, we'll go out and say that. We know we're in a static market. It's volatile, but it's static. We should have the honesty to say it. Telling the truth is the starting point for any recovery. And people who work for you know the truth, so if they hear you articulating it, they're not embarrassed about the fact they've got challenges. It's only us that's embarrassed. So we face into the unvarnished truth is the starting point, and then we can tell a journey as to how we're going to change it, and they'll come with us. Values to die for. Tell the journey. Equal respect. In the workplace, I start from the proposition that everybody who works for you, is worthy of equal respect. You're not more important because you're the marketing director or the chief executive. You're as important. You're an individual and a human being. And you're worthy of just the same respect as everybody else. Of course, we have different positions, different roles to play. There's command and control. There's a market which helps to find pay. But the principle that people are human beings, they've all got a part to play in improving the business, and there's only one job description is to improve the business every day. Do what you can to improve the business and tell us what's wrong with it. Single status. I haven't had an office now since I left McKinsey, I dread to think, decades ago. I don't think, you know, offices, car parking places, all that is designed to divide people. Today we're here to unite people, to involve them. It all has to go. Job titles mean nothing to people. 
Now, why do people put job titles on badges? We don't care what your title is, we care what your name is. Involvement. And involvement is something you've got to do, it doesn't happen. It's not even natural. It's not natural for checkout operators or people in call centres to tell you, I've got an idea to improve the business. Actually, it's quite intimidating for a lot of people. People don't write letters nowadays anyway. They write an email or whatever. It's quite intimidating. They worry about it. You know, am I going to get ticked off for doing this? It's not my place. Amazing. It's a natural thing for people to feel. What's in it for me? So to make that happen, you've got to really reach out, do it dramatically, fracture the old culture. Invite people to tell you what's wrong and reward them, recognize them for doing so. That's why we did weird things, which some people now look back and say, well, that was a gimmick. Maybe it was. It was a gimmick with a purpose. We ran the biggest record, uh, suggestion scheme in the country, probably the biggest one there's ever been. I wrote 10,000 letters in four years to colleagues at Asda who had written to me with a suggestion for improving the business. Actually, it, was an, it wasn't my idea. It was Julian Richard's idea. But I, wrote, I signed every single letter because if people want to write to the boss, they want to reply from the boss. You know, if you go around companies, you see suggestions. My general advice on suggestion schemes is don't do it, incidentally, because typically it just is done so badly that it becomes an embarrassment. You know, you go into a reception of some company and you see a little suggestion box and you look in the bottom and there's three bits of paper and a piece of chewing gum. And once a month the box is opened and tipped out and some HR committee sort of looks and judges the best suggestion and gives it some absurd reward. It only works if you make it part of the culture. What you're saying is I want everybody to be involved. I'm not going to give you some ridiculous reward for it because most of the suggestions actually are well-meaning, but they're not implementable. Nonetheless, if somebody's made the effort, they deserve a reply. We had huge, rec- we had huge on recognition, because you've got to be very, very big on recognition to, to change the way of working, the habits of a lifetime. We even had uh, the Jaguar scheme. We had Jaguars. My, I had a lot of departing directors when I arrived at Asda. We had an old company car scheme, and they left behind these cars. For some reason, they were all big red Jaguars. Splendid. What did we do with them? I thought, anything we do them, we'll give them away as part of a recognition scheme. So anybody in the company could sponsor an item for a month. They get the store manager approval, they sponsored the item. They would give me the hours and time to drive the sales uplift. And the, the winner for the month would come up to Asda House and collect the keys to a red Jaguar. Take it home, park it on the drive, the neighbours look over the fence and think, blimey, they've had a promotion. (laughs) The repair bills were absolutely horrendous. (laughs) And worse than that, because it became famous, after three years or so, these Jaguars were clapped out and we had to go and buy some more, (laughs) just to keep it going. But you've got to do those things. You've got to say, we really, really mean it. No, we'll make a sacrifice. Okay, it costs us money and time, but that's the whole point. We really believe it. And lastly, you have to measure it. You know, I always said we measure the sales every week. Every Monday, you know, there'll be a meeting at Asdors. Every Monday morning, I talk to the team in Australia, and they're talking about the sales of last week. And it was a, it's a burning meeting. You know, it's, it's Christmas, or it's I, I did brilliantly, or we did badly. You're sunk in gloom, or you're euphoric, depending on what happened. You've got to feel the same about the morale and attitude of your people. Because if it's morale and attitude that drives performance, if that's what creates the discretionary effort, if that creates the service, then you better measure it. You've got to measure it all the time. Be on to it. Hold people accountable for it. Just to give you a very simple, I mean, we think that a job is a job is a job. I bet you all think there you go to a checkout at Waitrose or Tesco, it's all about the same thing. Fast checkout operator does 28 items a minute. A slow one does 14 items a minute. 30% of your labor is on the checkouts. 70% of your cost is labor. So this is huge. And I tell you, the fast checkout operator is scanning stuff through and chatting as she goes or he goes. He's confident, he's got personality, and the slow one, 
and say, my speed's about two a minute. You're perspiring. The queues are building up. You're saying, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, fiddling around. And the service collapses. So for checkouts, the biggest point of contact in the store, th- this is really pivotal. That's why in Coles and Asda, we measure checkout speeds every 15 minutes for every operator all through the time. It's not, it's not because we're trying to catch up on them. It's trying to help them because if they do the job fast, they'll find it fulfilling. And the best checkout operators get to be promoted and they train others. Point is, forget the slicing and dicing. Now, every job is a discretion job. Every skill is a craft skill. If you're cleaning the floor, you can be ten times better than the next person. And if you do, you need recognition for it. And you need to be valued, just like anybody else. If you're shilling the, filling the shelves, you can be 40% faster. And you need recognition for it. You need to feel part of it. If you feel part of it, and you enjoy the workplace community, and you're treated with respect, and you're part of something worthwhile, there's a chance that you'll go to work and feel inspired, and feel it's good to be here. And then, never mind the training video, I'm going to smile at the customers. Because in get, engagement in the colleague culture in ASDA and it Coles, and I hope in ITV, it becomes how we compete. It's not something grafted on the side. It is who we are. Today, you know, there's a lot of imitations around. There are a lot of people, probably some who do it much better than we ever did, but there's a danger in being fashionable. And engagement's a bit of a fashion. And I just think, before I finish, I'd remind, just to remind you, in my view, engagement is not an HR activity. HR is responsible, of course, for measuring and reporting on and coaching the team on how we manage people. But the management of the people, which is, how, which is all what engagement is about, is for the line. It's not a survey. I see lots of companies who do an annual survey. Each year, amazingly, the survey produced results a little bit better than last year. Whoop of triumph. The board feels satisfied. They're doing a great job. It goes in the bottom drawer till the following year. Worse still, the results are poor, in which case it rapidly goes into the bottom drawer till the following year. (laughs) It's not a survey. It's as we measure the sales. It's our success. And every line manager in the business has got to be held accountable for it. And the chief executive has got to take a direct interest and show that he's holding people accountable for it. And it's not a popularity contest. Sometimes, if you're asking the tough questions and you're doing the right thing for the business, the engagement results will go down. But you might as well know it. We go through tough times. We have to do difficult things. We have to try and bring people with us. The successful um, measures of engagement do ask really tough questions, the ones we don't want the answer to. And they do invite a response. And they are universally publicized all over the company because your best route to engagement is to shame the company into it. The results are up on the wall. We all feel, "Mm, we've got to do something about that. So what is it? To me, engagement is about leadership living the values in their personal conduct, in the way they work in the business, in the way they relate to individuals, in the respect they show people, in the values, in telling the journey and over-communicating. It's a way of managing which is measured through the line and which everybody's part of and and held accountable for. It's how you get ahead round here by engaging your people and getting the best out of them. It's a desire to involve and to recognize for ideas, to give praise, and to see involvement and recognition as far more important than transactions and pay. It's about total transparency. There's no such thing as it's not my place, it's not my role. We all want the company to succeed. If there's something not working, I can put up my hand. And it's a workplace I can believe in. I can go home and say, yes, I'm proud to be part of this. We're trying to do something better. Yes, we're trying, we've got problems, but we're facing those challenges, and I too am part of it. You see, people come to work to shine, and our job 
is to make them shine. Thank you very much.